Welcome to the coming apocalypse. Evangelist and pastor Paul Bagley will take you on a journey into the end times prophecy. He'll examine current world events and explain how they relate to the end times. For decades, Pastor Bagley has provided people all over the world with an understanding of today's world events from a biblical perspective. Now, here's your host, Pastor Paul Bagley. Welcome to the coming apocalypse. I'm Pastor Paul Bagley, and today we've got a great broadcast for you. We're going to be talking about the enemies around us. You say, what could that be? Well, if you was an Israeli living in Israel, you would understand it completely. Bomb shelters in every town, every village, and the realization that there are those that surround you who literally wish you didn't exist. And we brought in an expert to help us in this today, and all the way from Israel, Amit Grenfield will be here, and he will be sharing with you front line. He's, look, a tour guide who has magnificent understanding historically and the current situation developing in Israel, as well as a soldier himself. So when we come back, we'll be introducing to you, all the way from Israel, Amit Grenfell. We'll be right back. Released from Cincinnati, a four-part DVD set on the end times. Planet X, Nibiru, the seas rising, the pole shift, Clyde Lewis, John Moore, Stephen Bendenoon, and myself bringing forth dynamic information relevant to the last day. You can get this four-part DVD set at my website or individually at my Patreon channel. The heavens are shaking. This is a must-see. Get it now. All right, folks, we're glad you're with us. The enemies are around us. And uh, when you start thinking about Israel, you start thinking about all of the, um, boy, the tension they've had to deal with, uh, the wars, the attacks, the cheap shots, the anti-Semitism, it's everywhere. But we thought we would take some time and hear it from the very words, from the very mouth of a tour guide there in Israel and an Israeli soldier, Amit Grenfeld. Amit, so good to have you on the broadcast. Thank you very much for having me, Pastor. It's an honor to have you here today, and we're really excited. Uh, we, last year, of course, um, and this year, you was our tour guide. We've, both times we've came, it's been a great time with you. You're very knowledgeable and uh, a lot of fun, too. And you drink a lot of coffee, okay? You're my Everybody kind of guy. Everybody got to have an addiction. <laughs> <laughs> so let me ask you a question. Um, when we start talking about Israel, the beautiful, you know, a lot of people sometimes are a little bit afraid to come to Israel because they'll say, oh, no, you know, there's bombs going off and stabbings. But it's way, way, believe me, Jerusalem's way safer than Chicago, okay? So I heard, yes. Yes. It is a safe country. Yes. When uh, people land in Israel, one of the first questions they usually ask me is, why everybody seems to hitchhike in Israel? And uh, the answer is very simple. You see it yourself and you understand it. It's safe to hitchhike in Israel. Um, you have even young uh, girls hitchhiking all over the place. Uh, crime rate indeed is among the lowest in the Western world, actually. And uh, we are very proud in the personal safety in our streets. Yes. That is not where we meet troubles. It's Israel. not domestically is not your problem. I mean, because like you say, some of the nicest people in the world, folks, when you're in Israel, I mean, uh, just they, there's so much. You're proud of your nation. You're very proud of your nation. And they're very loyal. And I think part of that has to do with the fact that that the uh, young men and women joined the military at age 18. Is that right? That's right. For three years? We are all uh, joining the army at the age of 18. Boys needs to serve just a little bit of three years, um, just a little time in the army, two years and eight months usually. Um, and girls must serve two years altogether. After you finish your army service, which is a compulsory service. It's not a matter of volunteering. You can volunteer to special units, which many people do. Um, and after that, many of us stays in the army as reserve soldiers. And in case we have a war in Israel, it's a matter of when we will have the next war, then uh, basically everybody joins the army. You know, it's, we can't fathom it here in America rockets flying across the border into America. I mean, we just, we don't even know what that means. It's been so long since there's been 
actual conflict here. So uh, the American people, when they see this, they wonder how you, how you deal with it. How do the people of Israel deal with the, uh, you have bomb shelters. Everybody knows right where to go. You trained yes. up as a child. Is that true? It is true. It is true. Every village in Israel, every town, every neighborhood, the rocket siren, and every house by the law that was built after 1992 must have a bomb shelter to the level of a bomb shelter room in every apartment. So uh, even a very slow person uh, will be able to go into a safe zone in a matter of seconds. Uh, just like some states in America will have uh, siren sounds for tornadoes, God forbid, or other types of storms, right. we have uh, metal storms coming from time to time. Although most of the attacks, of course, are on certain areas across the borders, um, very rarely it goes into the inner parts of the country, right. which is very small. Right. Um, but it happened a few times in the past, and um, as we were talking earlier, um, there is a massive buildup around our borders of uh, very powerful militias, guerrilla and terror organizations that are armed to their teeth with state-of-the-art missiles, rockets, and a new weapon that seems to enter the Middle East now, armed drones, that uh, every, mm -hmm, every child can fly one of those today, carry yeah. a small bomb, and hit a target precisely where he wants. So this is a game changer of what's taking place in warfare now. Yes. Folks, uh, Amit has a, a book out called The Iranian Foreign Policy from an Israeli point of view. And you can get a copy of this book on uh, Amazon.com, yes, okay. and uh, it's a great book to give you a perspective of how the Iranians, uh, what their philosophy is or their ideology, but what does it feel like from an Israeli point of view? Help us understand that, because what does it mean? I mean, how do you, it seems like Iran just wants to destroy you. Every other day, either the Ayatollah Ali Khomeini says it, or Hassan yeah. Rouhani, the president, or General Hassan Kwasa, uh, Salami? Soleimani. Yeah, and all of them. I mean, so are they really as vicious? Do they really hate Israel like they say? First of all, let's give them some credit. I'm sure they're very honest in their hate. Um, <laughs> I do want us to separate the Iranian regime of the Iranian, from the Iranian people. Uh, okay. There are a lot of good people in Iran, and many of them, I'm sure, are saintful. Yes. Um, Iran used to be a very good friend of Israel and a good friend of the United States. Yeah. I know people that worked in Iran, in agriculture, in technological developments. We even helped them militarily. Um, well, that was all during the Shah of Iran. That's that before was the revolution. During the Shah. Right. After the revolution, Iran became a vicious enemy. And almost from day one, even during the terrible Iran Iraq war yes. that uh, squeezed their resources and they bled so hard, even during those years, they started supporting guerrilla warfare against Israel, which shows you that it is a very high priority for them. Um, it is a measure to rally the people around a foreign enemy, which is something that many Middle Eastern countries did, using Israel as the lower common ground. Iran is built of many tribes, many nations, and quite a few different types of religions are coming from Iran. Um, one of those unique religions that came out of Iran eventually ended up with shrines in Israel. Those are the famous Baha'is. Um, you have them not far away from here in Chicago, too. Yeah. Um, and they're heavily prosecuted in Iran. Yeah. Sometimes the regime is using Israel as an excuse for just about anything. Just to give you an example, a few, I think it was last year, an Iranian general stood up in front of the cameras and blamed Israel for stealing the rain clouds of Iran. For stealing the rain clouds? Stealing the rain clouds of Iran, that's why there is a drought. And so everything's Israel's fault, basically. Everything is Israel's fault, yes. Yeah. I, I believe even some officials in the government uh, try to laugh on him after that expression, <laughs> but it shows you the, the yeah. direction of thinking. Um, the thing is that, except uh, blaming us in every problem, uh, they are in putting billions of dollars, billions of dollars that nowadays it seems that they desperately need elsewhere, and feed up 
fuel up and arms militias all over Israel. In this uh, short book, I'm trying to provide a geographical overview of the Iranian presence in the Middle East. Well, it's not, as, okay, now if we take a look at the situation, we realize that there's Hamas in Gaza. They are funded uh, basically by the Iranian regime. By many, many different um, Islamic organizations too. Uh, Iran is subsidizing Hamas partly, but they're also building up another terror army called the Islamic Jihad. Yes. And right there been, in Gaza. They have no problem that they are radical Shiites and those are radical Sunnis in Gaza. If it comes to Israel, they will work together. So as much as uh, Sunnis and Shiites don't like to get along, they'll get along if, if they have a common enemy and that be in Israel. So in the Gaza case, they work with Sunnis. In Syria, they murder Sunnis yeah. every day using Shia, um, literally g armed gangs that they brought yeah. from all over the Shia world. People that are so desperate that they are willing to fight, to kill and to die for ridiculous salaries of 200 to 300 dollars a month, sometimes a little more. Right. And um, it is just amazing to see how flexible the Iranian regime is and how much of an oiled machine they build there. Well, you look at the proxies they have. Now they have uh, Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. That's the okay. strongest one. And they have the Houthis in Yemen. Um, right. they ha they're working with President Bashir al-Assad in Syria. They are. And they, they're pretty much what keeps him alive. Right. Over there. But, but then there's this weird thing I'm, I'm still struggling with is Russia. Mm -hmm. Okay, because <laughs> how many Russian Jews live in Israel? More than a million. Okay. And, um, and yet the Russians are uh, giving f uh, safe passage to the uh, Syrians and the Iranians as they're smuggling precision rockets across Syria into Hezbollah, am I right? To Lebanon, yes. And uh, Le it's right? It's amazing because in some aspects Iran and Russia see each other as competitors and rivals. I don't know if enemies, but... Rivals. Rivals, absolutely. Um, in the Caspian Sea, for example, there are lots of disputed uh, areas between them. Yet they work together to keep Assad alive, absolutely. And they share no mutual um, ideology to really speak of, except interests, yes. just dry, cynical interests. Yes, and, and uh, part of that interest is the Holy Land, there's no question. And, and when, I, when I take a look at uh, uh, Israel, I realize that the nation of Israel, and when I look in the Bible, okay, if I go to Ezekiel 38, I find... Russia, Turkey, Iran, Persia, uh, involved in a prophesied war to, to come up against Israel at some point, Ezekiel 38 and 39. Does that ever, when you guys are, uh, you know, you're, you're, you're still in the army, and uh, yeah, I remember just wasn't long ago, you were just uh, uh, deployed again. I'm not sure exactly where you had to go, but you were involved. And does that ever cross your mind does it cross the mind of the average Israeli soldier with the prophecies of Ezekiel 38 and 39? Don't answer that till we come right back. Folks, we'll be right back in just a minute. We're going to find out. i got to get into the mind of the Israeli soldier, just what they think, okay, from a biblical perspective. We'll see you in just a moment. A brand new DVD set on the signs of his coming. We took a very extensive look at the prophecies in the book of Matthew chapter 24 and how they play out across the Bible. The signs of his coming takes a strong look at the comparison of the days of Noah to the coming of Jesus Christ. Are you ready for the signs and do you understand he's coming soon? Get it at my website right now. All right, folks, we're glad you're back. Of course, uh, Meet Grinfield is with us here and of course, uh, I just asked you a loaded question, okay? Uh, what is the soldiers, the Israeli soldiers, th do they think about prophecy at all? I mean, uh, the Bible, the Torah, the prophets, so important to the uh, nation of Israel. Does this scripture ever cross their mind? I believe that we do understand that we live inside an amazing time. Um, we have a very long collective memory and lots of promises and lots of 
Jewish generations out there all over the world pray to return to the country. And I believe that the, an average Israeli do understand um, that we are coming back from the four corners of the world. Um, just do a DNA test on me. I'm a little bit Brazilian Jewish, a little bit Romanian Jewish, a little bit Lithuanian Jewish. All right. There is some Russian background too. Okay. And the Greenfield family has some uh, Austrian orange, actually. Okay. That's how it came. So uh, we are, we are coming back well, from everywhere. you know, my wife everywhere. Heidi, she just did her DNA test, and she's uh, a little bit uh, Polish uh, Jewish and a little bit Russian Jewish. Uh, and she might have a, another one or two in there, I'm not sure, but uh, so the law of return is what you're referring to now, the people coming back. Partly, yes, and a very exciting event will happen uh, in two days, actually. My brother is getting married, and uh, he's getting married to a beautiful young Moroccan girl. Okay. Uh, Moroccan Jewish, and yes. my other brother married a Moroccan girl, so we are now what's leaving it, it leaving it right now. Let's see, uh, so what's the typical Jewish wedding like? I mean, is it... Uh, um, you usually remember the first hour of the wedding, then you usually, as you go drunk, uh, yeah. you remember less and less. Maybe it's the last hour <laughs> is completely gone. Absolutely, right? okay. absolutely. But uh, you might find yourself dancing with the rabbi okay. at a certain point. <laughs> uh, those weddings uh, contain usually at least 250 people wow. and above. Wow. Um, Families are coming from all over the country. Right. Um, families flying from abroad. We still have a lot of Jews out there. Wow. Um, and it is, those weddings are very happy. Um, I would call them less official than American weddings. Right, right. If we are trying to compare the two, but the happiness is identical. That's it's, great. Um, yeah, of course, so, holy vows. So you have happy families living in Israel and, uh, and very focused, very religious, uh, uh, there's different sects of, of followers of Judaism, and, um, and there's a lot of Christians now in Israel. It's more large, it's getting larger all the time, from what I understand. Yes. So, how did, with the enemies surrounding you, and uh, uh, what is the Israeli point of view of, will you, are, are you confident that God is going to be there for you now? Now that this nation's been rebirthed, okay, 71 years. The Americans, our president, declaring Jerusalem as the capital of Israel to the world. Big deal, wasn't it? It's a huge deal. Yeah, yes. and, and, and America's close. We, we're strong with it you. It is uh, an amazing uh, support on the moral level for sure. Uh, many people are asking me that question. It brings a little smile because people need to remember that Jerusalem was the Jewish city for the last 3,000 years. We always said in every Shabbat, in every Saturday next year, in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. Um, the national movement of the Jewish people is not Israelism, it's Zionism. Right. And Zion is the fortress of Zion in Jerusalem. Right. Um, some would say that the meaning of Jerusalem in Hebrew means heritage city, although it had tons of different meanings. Um, but this is the one I love the most, heritage city. Um, and what your president did is indeed a very important declaration. Um, people should talk about things and not ignore facts. Right. That is for sure. Um, and a few nations already followed the American one and moved their embassies um, to Jerusalem, and others are slowly moving parts of their embassies. It's, it's step a gradual. By step. It's... It is a gradual. For the simple Israeli, um, it, it is just this rare feeling that we don't have usually in history that we're being supported. Truly. Right. How important is the rebuilding of the third temple to the average Israeli? How important? That's a good question. Um, the average Israeli on an average day does not even think about that. Uh, our daily life, our daily life, just, just trying like to yours. survive. Of course, yeah, yeah. Yeah, trying to survive. Thanks God not only to survive, but take the kids to a vacation. Right. And uh, I mean, Israel is doing pretty good in the last couple of years. Um, if an average Israeli think about the Third Temple, that's actually a matter of dispute inside the Jewish rabbis for centuries. Uh, oh. Most of the rabbis actually believe and preach that even going up to visit Temple Mount is forbidden until the Messiah will come ah. and build the Third Temple for the Jewish people. So there's a percentage of rabbis who are saying, let's not worry about this. When Messiah comes, he'll build it. 
And, there's, and then there's another group of rabbis who are saying, we got to build it so Messiah will come. It is a small group. Okay. It is a small group, very sound, but uh, a very small group. Yeah. Mo most of the Israelis are fine with the fact that we can go and pray as free people next to the Western Wall. Right. And, um, you know, celebrate the Bar Mitzvah in the Jewish quarter and then finish right. at the Western Wall. I think that's enough for most of our people. Um, the Jewish nation moved centuries ago from being focused in the temple in focus in the Bible. Yeah, and I um, found that out when I met with Rabbi Yehuda Glick, okay, even though he is a, a really a leading proponent to mm -hmm. the building of the third temple, and he was in the Knesset, yes. uh, and Rabbi Yehuda uh, Tuli Weiss uh, from Breaking mm -hmm. Israeli News and some of these others, uh, though that that's a big part maybe for them, the average uh, Israeli says, Look, you know, we're so happy we have our land. We, 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 have, we have a nation now. We can go to the wall and pray. We have freedom. We have freedom. Finally. Democracy's big. Yes. Free, free to, 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 you know, to pray as yeah. you are and what you are. And most of the Israelis actually, maybe I'll surprise many, but um, we believe that everyone should come and pray in Jerusalem, Muslims, Christians, and Jews, Baha'is, and everybody. Hipsters can come too, for all we care. <laughs> Everybody is welcome. Uh, but I, I think Judaism basically fits very well with democratic values. Um, the, the two are combined. Some, some of us say that we should be more Jewish. Some believe that we should be more democratic. And the truth is somewhere in a gentle balance. Sounds there in the like middle. America, OK? Has a similar, like similar, similar problem. Course. We have the right wing conservatives and we have the left leaning liberals and then somewhere in the middle is the folks that say, can we just have a little bit of both, you know? Uh, but overall, I think that's kind of how people are in generally. Absolutely. But you have a dynamic that no other nation has and that is a constant threat. Look, and we're gonna talk about this in our next broadcast. We're gonna go to the 1967 and the Six Day War because you, you, you've just written a great book on that. But the fact that every day your nation has to stay on alert. You have, you've got the Iron Dome that has to shoot down the incoming rockets. You have to have people ready and trained and, 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 uh, at all times. Yet you don't live in fear, do you? No, not really. Sometimes when there is uh, a state of emergency, then there are some fearful thoughts. Uh, you're usually more afraid of uh, what am I going to do with my kids now? Right. Or what my wife will do with them when I'm in the army and she needs to take care of the three of them while school is off and canceled. Right. Um, I don't think I fear for the very existence of Israel. No. Mm -hmm. And you shouldn't. According to the scriptures, you shouldn't. At this point in time, prophecy, I believe, is certainly the, the rebirth of Israel as a, as a nation was uh, prophesied in Ezekiel 37 with the dry bones. And they've come back together, you know, and now the nation is thriving. And, um, and I think uh, we're moving into the next phase of biblical prophecy. And it's an exciting time to watch what's going on. But at the same time, that does include at some point, uh, again, you're going to deal with another uh, invasion as, as according to the prophets of the Bible, similar to 67. But again, God is going to look after uh, the nation of Israel. I have no confidence, I have total confidence in that. We'll be right back, folks. Just a minute with the meat. A brand new book I've just finished called Reflections from the Land of the Prophets. This book is filled with beautiful pictures, a pictorial, if you will, of the Holy Land, and some definite great insight to the prophets that once spoke mightily in the times leading us up to the present. It's a prophetic word, a reflection of what God has spoken, not only historically from the past, but for the future. Go to my website. It's available now. All right, all right. Amit Grenfield's with us again. His book, The Iranian Foreign Policy. Look at it from the view of an Israeli. Hey, what you said, maybe I should look in my backyard during the break. Venezuela. Uh, why are you yes. saying that? Why, why do I need to look in my backyard? Because there is a lot of Iranian activity in Venezuela. Um, they're even talking about uh, 
an attempt to convert people in Venezuela into Shia Islam. Uh, Venezuela and parts of uh, Latin America are used by Iranians as a huge area which they can smuggle goods into Iran. Uh, the sanctions that America puts on them for so many years works, but there are ways to pass at least parts of them and to relieve the pressure just a little bit. Um, Hezbollah, which is a tight Iranian proxy, for example, smuggles drugs, um, cigarettes even, parts of vehicles and cars, um, wherever that can work, can work. Uh, terror and crime, if you'll ask me to begin with, they're the same thing, yes. but uh, sometimes they cooperate together, so you actually have different horrible cartels. Um, in the case of Venezuela, it is literally open relationship between Iran and their president, their very yeah. unpopular president, Mr. So Maduro. I'm just looking at the picture you have right in here of Nicolas Maduro and uh, Iranian President Hassan Rouhani shaking hands with each other. Shaking hands. You know, we're worried here in the United States uh, about our southern border uh, for several reasons. Uh, one is the fact that uh, radical uh, Shiites could come up through the bo southern border of Mexico into America. We've already been catching some of them. So, and they're coming out of Venezuela. So there's uh, apparently there's a um, some of the terrorists coming out of the Middle East are winding up in Venezuela and then working their way up to Central That's America. A possibility through the Mexican border. Yes. So they're using the huge human tragedy over there. Uh, that's for sure. And uh, so, again, America needs to wake up and realize that, um, you know, we are vulnerable. We may not think so, but we, you'd think we would understand that. But we, at times, I think that because so many years pass where there's no major conflict, that people get so uh, complacent, you know, and they don't watch what's going on. Where in Israel, you stay on top of your game all the time, and because of it, it's, I feel extremely safe. I feel safer in Israel than anywhere else I go. I'll be honest. I just, I just walk anywhere I want. I'm not worried. I think the fact that our eyes are open uh, makes us a bit more self-confident. But it is um, scary when you think about it. They are closing on us from Lebanon, from Syria. Uh, they are knocking on the Jordanian door as well. Um, they are using the Sinai Desert, which is our south border, as a, a highway for smuggling weapons into terrorists in Gaza, if it's Hamas, mainly the Islamic Jihad, uh, you will find them active in Yemen, in Iraq, in Afghanistan as well, in Morocco. They got all the way to Morocco to support uh, a guerrilla warfare against the king. Folks, Amit Grinfield, his book, you can find it on Amazon.com.